Chapter 23 Under cover of the fading light, I slipped out from the tree line and around the back of the trailer, pulling myself up the mounted ladder as smoothly as possible. I may be big, but I can be light on my feet, and with the pole ramping back up to its full force, I had something of an advanced warning system in case my movements caught someone's attention. I stayed as flat as possible after climbing onto the roof of the trailer, both to reduce my visibility and to spread my weight out to risk the least amount of disturbance. I inched forward on my belly, moving carefully toward the first plastic skylight and minding the multiple psychic connections tightening at my chest. An invisible tensile pressure increased, and the vibrations the wires produced were getting stronger. Beckett had tried to argue with me, saying he was smaller and lighter. He waved his fancy phone in my face and said he could record whatever he saw through the skylight and report back. Then we could figure out the next move together. And for about a half second, I actually considered it. But what if any one of about a dozen things went wrong? There were too many guns to count, and that was before I could assess what was inside the trailer. The kid hired me to get him to the girl safely. He might have been better suited for recon, but there was too much risk. If, when, something went wrong, I needed to be able to deal with it without having to worry about the kid. I paused as I reached the skylight and let my cheek rest flat against the roof, almost dazed by the surprising realization. What the actual fuck? I was worried about Beckett Miller? One-time Nazi fanboy desperately misguided youth? And the idiot who was too girl-crazy to see this shit show was a waste of time? No. That didn't make sense. And I didn't care what Murph thought. I'm not that good of a guy, and Gertie would be the first to agree. Maybe I was just worried about my contract with the kid. A deal he optimistically prepaid and overpaid for. I was worried about fulfilling my end of the contract. Yeah, that was probably it. Abraham Owens, the king of superior work ethic. Beckett fucking Miller. I sighed and inched forward peering over the dome of the skylight before immediately yanking my head back. It was a clear, bright, and unobstructed view down into the main space inside the trailer. In my quick glimpse, I spotted people at the dinette, others on stools, and movements in the peripheral shadows. It was too clear of a view, and anyone would have to only look up to see my ugly mug staring down at them. I stopped a growl of frustration somewhere low in my throat, and glanced further down the roof. The next outcropping was a vent over the bathroom. I carefully shimmied over to the slatted covering, peeked in, and was immediately assaulted with the odor of a very recent BM. A fan was spinning in the vent, blowing the smell directly into my face. Through the slats, I saw a man press the flusher with his foot, wash his hands, and then exit the bathroom. He flicked a switch on the wall as he went, and the fan inside the vent stopped. With the bathroom door open, I could clearly hear the voices from inside the trailer. That was something, but I still needed to get my eyes on Beckett's girl to be sure. Unfortunately, through the vent slats and the fan blades, I could only see a few feet beyond the open door. I twisted my angle carefully and... Bingo, motherfucker. At the new angle, I had a clear view of the bathroom mirror. In the mirror, I could see the rest of the trailer through the bathroom door. Councilman White was mindlessly picking at items on the kitchenette counter while he spoke to someone I couldn't see. He gave the impression of someone trying to play his cards close to his chest. Allowing to Nat to continue to play out unchecked is irresponsible at best, White was saying, and an act of terrorism at its worst. How much longer are you going to play this game, Peter? How many more lives are you planning on ending? A pair of girls crossed White's path, and I'm pretty sure one of them looked like Beckett's girlfriend, Corey. They sat down just out of view of the mirror next to Peter, if my glimpse through the skylight had been accurate. One of the girls said, He just doesn't understand your vision, Peter. There was a sad, drawn-out sigh, almost theatrical, and then another voice spoke. 
It carried a strangely familiar tone, and my chest tightened in an instinctual response. A dull ache began knocking behind my eyes. I knew enough to tell that my physical reaction wasn't due to any emotional pull from inside the trailer. I could read those piano wires just fine. This was some kind of base lizard brain response to the sound of Peter's voice. I didn't like it one bit. I admit, Councilman, this little tete a you and I have found ourselves engaged in. The pause this time was definitely theatrical. White looked up from the counter and over in Peter's direction. It's been amusing, a happy little distraction, if you will. And to that end, I can certainly appreciate why you would assume this has all been a silly little game. In fact, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, at times, feel like I was playing a game as well. There are certain pieces being placed across the board. This is not some kind of chess game, White spat, his voice low and angry. No, not for you. Checkers, maybe, but big picture. Another dramatic sigh, as if the simple act of being in the presence of White was an unconscionable burden that lowered his IQ. White wasn't having it. You want to talk big picture? His posture shifted aggressively. Big picture is that with a stroke of my pen, I issue an order to the SCPD, labeling the Suns as a domestic terrorist organization and having you and every single one of your acolytes rounded up and tossed in jail. That's the big picture. I am not playing your games anymore, Peter. You are operating under the delusion that you ever were, Councilman, Peter said, his voice smooth and calm. Samson? White tried to hide a look of confusion when Peter addressed the cop by name. Officer Stu Samson stepped into view of the mirror, moving next to White. His shotgun was slung across his back, and he hitched his good thumb in his belt. Samson nodded at Peter. Go ahead and tell the councilman what happens when he strokes his pen, Peter said. Samson glanced sideways at White. The councilman, for whatever it was worth, had stamped down his confusion and looked entirely too confident in Samson's response. A wire vibrated in my chest, and I could taste Samson's duplicity before he said a single word. What happens... Samson said slowly, turning back to Peter and dropping his head in a single nod. Is whatever you say happens, sir. Another vibration, this one from White. A jolt of fury that matched his expression. So much for playing his cards close to his chest. Our deal predated. You have been very well compensated. White could barely get the words out. Samson lifted a shoulder. You did a lot to get the movement started, boss, but it's like the girl said, you just don't have Peter's vision, Samson said. Vision? He's like a child running around after finding his father's gun. White turned to the still-obscured Peter. You do not know the first thing about the power you wield over the suns. All of this... White waved his hands around him, gesturing to the rally at large. This is not a movement. This is not progress. This does not advance the cause that real men, genuine devotees, have spent their entire lives committed to. This is little more than infantile children play-acting on a stage far larger than they would ever hope to aspire to. Silence filled the trailer as a jarring amount of dissonant vibrations twisted the wires in my chest. The girl shifted as Peter rose to his feet. I could see a sliver of his clothing, but his face never came into view of the mirror. I understand, Councilman. Fuck you. You still think we're playing that clever little game? Peter rested a hand on Samson's shoulder. I saw the sleeve of a dark green coat or jacket. You thought the power you wielded over the police force was unimpeachable, and that loyalty... Mattered? Peter was addressing Samson now. Tell me, officer, have there been times when you weren't fully loyal to me? Be honest. 
Samson's eyes shifted uncomfortably. I mean, you knew the deal from the start. I respect your vision, sir, but I got alimony and loans and... What he's trying to say, Councilman, Peter cut in, patting Samson on the shoulder before pulling his arm back, is that his loyalty lies with money. Not me. Not you. And certainly not any cause. And that's fine. I don't begrudge him his motives. They just don't matter. Samson was helpful, even when he was betraying my confidence to you. A subtle twinge of confusion traveled up Samson's wire. It took him far too long to process Peter's use of the past tense. Wait, Peter. He did his job, Peter continued, speaking directly to White. He was a very useful idiot. Whipped! The shot was swift and effectively muzzled by a silencer. Blood and brain matter splattered across White's face as Officer Stu Sampson fell to his knees. His piano wire sang out, not with pain, but abject confusion before snapping away, forever silent. The dirty cop collapsed forward, dead. Everyone down in the trailer was frozen in shock. All but Peter. He stepped forward, his back to the mirror, and placed the gun on the counter. Clearly, he had no further use for it. White's jaw moved, but the words were slow to come. You fucking psychotic. Spare me, Peter said, his voice flat and indifferent. I told you this isn't a game. This is just the warm-up. Peter started for the door of the trailer, and I twisted hoping to catch a glance of his face. There was something inside me that needed to see who this person was. Where the hell do you think you're going? White shouted. Peter pushed the door open. You bore me, Councilman, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I have an entire army of useful idiots to entertain me. Peter! The door slammed shut, and Peter was gone.